Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California here in Studio MC3 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. Linux News Log is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. For those of you who have, thank you so much for subscribing. And with that, let's go ahead and get into the stories for this episode. Starting off over at eWeek.com, Linux Foundation's C2 continues to fund open source, uh, open source security efforts. The Core Infrastructure Initiative, that's the C2 or the CII, uh, was launched in the wake of Heartbleed to provide funding for critical open source infrastructure projects, and that effort continues to advance. Uh, one of the key takeaways from the Heartbleed vulnerability, the Heartbleed vulnerability in 2014, was that there was a need for more funding for critical open source technology projects. That's why the Linux Foundation created the Core Infrastructure Initiative in April of 2014, and now in 2015. Uh, they're continuing to move forward with that effort. So among the financial backers of the C2 are Adobe, Bloomberg, Hewlett Packard, VMware, Rackspace, NetApp, Microsoft, Intel, IBM, Google, Fujitsu, Facebook, Dell, Amazon, and Cisco. All told, uh, they have raised approximately $5.5 million in committed funds over the next three years. So pretty cool definitely uh, we'll be I'll be keeping an eye on this to see you know what comes of it uh, how it turns out and that sort of thing from androidheadlines.com Lenaro CEO briefly talks about project era during the Lenaro Connect 2015 conference Lenaro CEO uh, briefly talks about project era during the Lenaro Connect 2015 conference uh, Project Era devices will be a huge cornerstone of the future smartphone landscape, primarily because it will give individuals the chance to build a smartphone to their desired specifications by choosing different components of the device, including things like the camera, processor, battery capacity, and even the screen size of the device. This is pretty cool. Uh, including, uh, let's see, uh, developing a device like this, though, isn't without its roadblocks and difficulties. And during the recent Lenaro Connect conference for 2015, CEO George Gray talks about some of those hurdles and gives attendees of the conference a hands-on of an R device assembly while discussing the different modules. Now, we reported on this previously, and it looks like they really are, uh, you know, moving forward uh, with us uh, trying to get something, you know, that is actually usable and modular at the same time. That's pretty cool. From gmanetwork.com, custom Linux malware is used in brute force attacks. This is kind of scary. A new malware specifically targeting Linux users is being used to target servers and network devices to steal data, a security vendor warned this week. FireEye said the Linux rootkit malware dubbed XOR.DDoS uses multiple persistence mechanisms, including a rare Linux rootkit to attack victims. Potentially, the attacks can hit desktop machines and mobile or embedded devices. So uh, definitely be keeping an eye out for this. Um, hopefully, uh, this gets patched up in the, in the sooner rather than later, for sure. From uh, EE Times India, over at eetindia.co.in, ARM takes on Internet of Things security with OffSpark buyout. So ARM has acquired... Uh, the Netherlands-based OffSpark, a supplier of uh, transport layer security that will get folded into its embed uh, operating system for its Cortex-M cores. Um, they announced this back in October. They make, they, they're trying to make embed a unifying code for the fragmented Internet of Things where security is an increasingly key concern. Uh, so part of this, uh, OffSpark's Polar SSL, which is an implementation of their trans of transport layer security for embedded systems, will form the core of ARM embed communication security and software cryptography strategy. Uh, they will also give the Polar SSL product a new name. 
uh, ARM Embed TLS and continue to provide it as open source, both as a standalone product and later this year as part of Embed. So you'll still be able to get it open source, which is fantastic. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're even reporting on it here. You know, definitely something you want to keep an eye out for. From ZDNet.com, Microsoft and Samsung settle contract dispute over Android patent payments. Microsoft and Samsung uh, are have officially uh, in the Android patent royalty suits um, that Microsoft filed against Samsung um, back in August 2014. They've officially closed this. Uh, they... Microsoft claimed that there was a breach of contract by Samsung involving Android patent royalties following reported months of attempts between the two companies to resolve their issues. So the contract in question was the September 2011 multi-year IP agreement Samsung signed with Microsoft via which Samsung has been paying Microsoft per device royalties for its Android phones. Under that 2011 agreement, Samsung and Microsoft agreed to cross-license their intellectual property. Makes sense. Companies do this all the time. Uh, Samsung and Microsoft, uh, with Samsung paying Microsoft an undisclosed amount for each Android-based phone and tablet that it sold. Uh, in October 2014, it came to light, thanks to an unsealed court filing, that Samsung paid Microsoft $1 billion for a single year's worth of patent licensing royalties. So Samsung claimed that Microsoft Nokia handset acquisition breached the business collaboration part of the agreement between the two companies and things have, you know, effectively gone sour since then, as we are all aware. So uh, really sucky, but at the same time, you know, what are you going to do? That's just how it is sometimes. Also from ZDNet, uh, mission funding. Uh, funding all those small but important open source projects. That's right. In 2014, Open OpenSSL had a gigantic security problem, Heartbleed. Its root cause, a combination of blind trust in the open source programming method and a shoestring budget. Less than a year later, Warner Koch, uh, author and sole maintainer of the popular GNU Privacy Guard email encryption program revealed he was going broke supporting GNU PG. This is not surprising. Linux and open source in general tends to be a labor of love. As, a, as an example, I largely do this show as a labor of love. I talk about Linux and open source things because I think it's an important subject. I don't charge for those of you watching and downloading the show. Uh, and I r rarely carry uh, advertisements or sponsors here on the show. Although, uh, depending on some months, you know, it, it, the show's actually been getting more popular and I may be forced to because I, I can't afford to pay the bandwidth bill and I don't have a small bandwidth bill. This is a huge bandwidth bill. Anyway, different subject. Anyway, um, his Cox story ha had a happy ending. However, the Linux foundation via its core infrastructure initiative, which we just talked about, donated $60,000 to GNUPG, then e-payments vendor Stripe, and Facebook agreed to sponsor the program's development to the tune of $50,000 a year. Awesome. That is fantastic. That's great, but something's seriously wrong when small but vital open source programs can be ignored until either the code breaks from neglect or its programmers abandon it to make a living from more lucrative projects. It's not the fault of open source itself. This is true. Um... Every major technology company invests millions of dollars in open source development today. Even Microsoft is now a major open source supporter. So that's not really the problem. The big problem that this blog post from uh, Stephen J. Von Nichols points out is that there are still many small but important programs that don't get headlines and millions of dollars a day or e even just dollars. And so uh, this is something that's sorely needed. Um, I, I hope you go visit the website, read this article. Um, it's, it's definitely an interesting read and uh, something that needs attention. From eWeek, Red Hat and NEC to create the OpenStack platform for NFV, the joint solution will lever NEC's infrastructure offering and Red Hat's cloud solution to help service providers quickly adopt NFV. Um, 
which NFE is Network Functions Virtualization. The two companies which have partnered on other network functions virtualization efforts now are building a cross-platform cloud platform that will leverage NEC's infrastructure and open Red Hat's OpenStack infrastructure and enable service providers to more quickly modernize their networks as they move to NFV. Basically, just a new way of doing the same things that we've always done, just in a more consistent and automated fashion. Uh, this next story that we uh, I would like to talk about, unfortunately, the uh, website that is hosting this is getting a massive amount of traffic and it's taking a really long time to load. But essentially, the uh, first Ubuntu phones are are now available. Um, if I can get some more details, I don't remember the exact details, but uh, definitely check it out. Uh, it's uh, there we go. First Ubuntu phone is ready for launch. This is over at the Sun Daily. The handheld and operating system combination uh, that promises so much is finally coming to market, but anyone thinking that they'll be able to plug the Ubuntu phone into a monitor and start using it like a PC is going to be disappointed, unfortunately. Uh, the phone is called the Aquarius, Aquarius E4.5. After a two-year wait, the Aquarius E4.5 is the smartphone with a first smartphone with a Linux-based Ubuntu operating system has arrived. But when it goes on sale on Monday, it will only be in Europe and to begin with at least solely via online flash sales, which kind of stinks. The benefits of an Ubuntu phone first came to, to the wider public's attention back in 2013. When they created the Ubuntu operating, when the UK company that created the Ubuntu operating system, Canonical, attempted to fund it via one of the most ambitious crowdfunding campaigns in history. So, at any rate, uh, the phone that has essentially resulted from all of that effort, the Aquarius E4.5, will have pretty mundane specs a 4.5 inch screen, a gig of RAM, 8 gigs of storage, and at $192, we'll be running a version of Ubuntu, which has a unique way of pulling together and presenting information to users. So pretty cool. That uh, is pretty neat. I would love to get my hands on one. Um, we'll see how it goes. That will do it for this edition of Linux News Log. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes which you can find online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. For those of you who have, thank you for supporting the show and subscribing. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.